Can you see my screen okay? Looks good. Perfect, thank you. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to our Zoom education session on understanding behavior changes in dementia. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this session. Our presentation today is all about discovering the meaning behind behavior when a person is experiencing changes in their brain as a result of dementia. We will learn how brain changes can impact that, the way that a person living with dementia can think and the way that they act. My name is Chris Van Leuven and with me today is Shelby Berry and we're education coordinators here at the Alzheimer's Society of Peterborough, Ortha Lakes, Northumberland and Halliburton. We recognize that Throughout our discussion today, there might be several questions that come up and just because, uh, you know, in the interest of time and because I'm not always able to see the chat while I'm sharing my PowerPoint screen, I'd ask you to hold your questions till the end of the presentation. Please feel free to, you know, take a, a paper and pen and jot down any questions that might come up for you, um, or you can post them in the chat just so that you don't forget to ask them when we get to the end of the presentation. And I wanna thank you in advance for your help with this. So let's get started today by helping to increase our understanding of why behaviors can change when a person has dementia. To understand behavioral change, we first need to understand that significant changes happen in the brain throughout the progression of dementia. When a person has dementia, the disease process that's occurring in the brain can affect various lobes of the brain. When these lobes are, are damaged or if they experience some shrinkage or atrophy, we also see resulting changes in the abilities or functions that those parts of the brain are responsible for controlling. As a result of damage to the brain, a person with dementia can experience physical, emotional, mental, and cognitive changes as well as behavioral changes. In the past, these behaviors have, have often be re been referred to as challenging behaviors. And that's mostly been due to the recognition that they kind of create some challenges for the care partners that are supporting them. Today, we're gonna move away from that term challenging behaviors. Instead, we're gonna use the more person-centered and appropriate term, responsive behaviors. Because as we're about to learn, the behaviors that a person with dementia might demonstrate are in response to something that's happening for that person. They're not intended to be challenging for others. We hope you will help us to reframe these behaviors and help others to understand that the person's not doing it on purpose. They're not doing it to be challenging. Their behaviors are a result of what's happening in their brains. As I just mentioned, a person's brain and their subsequent behavior are completely connected. Let's take some time to look at the most common changes that a person with dementia can experience throughout the progression of the disease. It's important to note that a person with dementia might not experience all of these changes because dementia is unique to each person that experiences it. However, these reflect some of the most common changes that might occur. One of the most common behavior changes that can occur early in the disease process is a loss of awareness, or we also term this like a loss of insight. People with loss of insight do not have any knowledge or awareness of their illness or of their condition. You might think of it this way. The person with dementia doesn't know that they don't know that they don't know, and they can often forget that they forget. Damage in the frontal lobe of the brain as a result of dementia causes this loss of insight and awareness. Just like you and I, the person with dementia is acting on the information that their brain is telling them at any given time. The information could be wrong according to what our sense of reality is, but the person may still act on that information because their brain no longer has the ability to use that proper reasoning. They believe what their brain is telling them is true. 
The person with dementia may therefore lose awareness of changes in their abilities to do things that they've always done. So they might, you know, refuse help from other people, or they might blame others when things don't go as they expected or when things go wrong. This can often lead to arguments or to disagreements. You, you know, you might hear the person say something like, I don't need your help. I can shower myself or I'm quite capable of driving myself. I've been doing it all my life. Those are the things that can, can come up with loss of awareness. In addition, as a result of damage to the frontal lobe of the brain, the person might experience changes in their judgment. So they may not now know how to judge appropriate clothing to wear outside on a cold winter day or outside on a hot winter, on a hot summer day. So they might wear too little or too much clothing for the weather. Care partners may notice unusual behavior or behavior that they might see as inappropriate um, because the person might experience a change in their ability to regulate their social inhibitions. So they might act on information without considering how their behavior could impact others. They might say things or they might do things that they normally would not have done. Um, so an example of this, they may, you know, reach over and take food off somebody else's plate. Uh, they might call somebody a name. They might um, use, they might swear or use some inflammatory language when they wouldn't, that's not something that they'd normally do. People with dementia have loss of awareness um, and they may also experience an increased risk uh, to their safety and their well being because of this loss of awareness. So they might not recognize when a medical matter needs some attention, or they might do something that puts their safety at risk. And this happens because they might not know how to judge what is safe versus what is unsafe. So the person might have fallen and then forgotten that they're injured. It might not occur to them to seek out medical attention for a possibly sprained or broken ankle. The person, on the other hand, might not understand that taking a dish towel and throwing it on top of a hot stove could cause a fire. Um, or they might not understand that eating food that has been spoiled or um, that's gone moldy or has been sitting around could make them sick. Those are some of the risks that come uh, with this loss of awareness. Probably the most common behavior change that people associate with dementia is memory loss. So a person with dementia experienced memory loss, they might have trouble with all the different areas of their memory. Um, Short-term memory is the one that's usually affected or lost early on in the disease process. The person might have difficulty remembering recent conversations, details, and events. The person might not be able to uh, recall something that's happened, you know, either this morning or yesterday or last week. It's difficult when a person loses their short-term memory because short-term memory is very important for new learning. Eventually, as dementia progresses, a person will also use their lose that long-term memory as well. Um, and as a result, they will have difficulty remembering, you know, information, past experiences, and really how to do things that they've always been able to do. Long-term memory though, it usually does stay intact until later on in the disease process. A person living with dementia might also have difficulties with what we call habitual memory. So they might not remember how to do things that they've always done or that have been repeated over and over, um, or they might not be able to remember things uh, that involve a sequencing of steps. So uh, when you think of a task like tying your shoes, uh, they may not be able to remember the steps for tying their shoes or put those steps in the right order. It might be difficult for a person when they now have trouble doing things that they've done their entire lives. Finally, the person with dementia might experience problems with their unconscious memory. Uh, and this is remembering things without thinking about it. So our unconscious memory is enabled by our previous experiences. 
So examples of this are things like driving a car, brushing your teeth, uh, putting a pot on to boil for pasta, buttoning the buttons on a shirt. These activities are often done unconsciously without really having to think about the steps or how to go about doing it. It is important for us to note here though, that the ability to learn through routine can still be present in dementia. So if we think of a person living with dementia who's recently moved to a long-term care home, they may you know, be able to find their way to the washroom if they repeat those steps or repeat that path uh, several times over for several days. Um, now, if you ask them, if you stopped and asked them the directions to the bathroom, they probably couldn't tell you. I'm gonna share a little analogy here that I found helped to broaden my own understanding of how memory loss from dementia happens. And it's called the, the sweater an analogy. From the time that we're born, our brains start to form memories. And over time, we build on these memories like knitting stitches in a sweater. So stitch upon stitch and row upon row, we start to build these memories over the course of our life on our way towards uh, building a sweater. And when a person develops dementia, depending on their age and depending on the situation, it's like getting to a point in that sweater and then when the onset of memory loss happens, it's like unraveling that sweater stitch by stitch, row by row backwards. The sweater continues to unravel as the dementia continues to progress. The last things learned or remembered are the first things lost. And the person will continue to lose memories as the sweater begins to unravel further and further back. Eventually, the unraveling starts to imp impact those long-term memories as well. So many people often assume that people living with dementia are living in the past when they have memory loss. And it's not that they're living in the past. They're living in the present moment but their brain only has access to past memories and past information, especially when their short-term memory bank is impaired. So the person now might only have access to their long-term memories if that's the only part of their memory that is working. And they act on those memories as though that's their current here and now reality. So their past experiences then become their present reality. So I hope that that analogy, I hope you found it as helpful as I did when I was first um, in learning about memory loss and dementia. Let's talk about a, another common behavior change and that's the loss of ability to recognize. And here it's the loss of ability to recognize sensory information. And this, you know, this loss of ability can really affect all five of our senses. It can occur across all five senses, including our sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. The person with dementia might not recognize certain people that they meet. Um, the loss of recognition, recognition can include mistaking someone from that they, they are meeting now for a person from their past. And this occurs due to their short-term memory loss and the brain only having access to those long-term memories. This sometimes happens when uh, a woman living with dementia mistakes her son for her husband because they share similar physical attributes, uh, their voices might sound the same. A person with dementia might meet someone and instantly react to them because they remind them of somebody from their past. People experiencing this particular change may also not recognize themselves in the mirror. A, again, and it's due to the memory loss, they might look at the mirror and see the reflection of a much older person when they believe themselves to be much younger. So uh, for example, if a person looks in the mirror and sees the reflection of an 80 year old person looking back at them, they might think that that person is intruding in their space because they may only perceive themselves to be you know, 40 or 50 years old. And therefore they don't recognize that that is in fact their own reflection in the mirror. 
A common challenge for people living with dementia is recognizing objects and knowing what they're used for. So this potential has potential to cause some safety issues. Um, in particular, if the object isn't used properly. Uh, so for example, a person might mistake a razor for a toothbrush because they're both you know, small, similarly shaped plastic objects, maybe similar in color, and they're both set out on the bathroom counter. Loss of recognition of objects can also cause fear in the person with dementia. If the object, you know, maybe doesn't seem at all familiar to them, or maybe it reminds them of a similar object from the past. So an example here is maybe in the backyard, they see a, a wooden pergola, which uh, is one of those um, kind of shade covers, and they may, you know, see that wooden frame and, and mistake it for something like a gallows, if that's something that they're familiar with. People with dementia might also misinterpret their sensory information. So they may misinterpret what has been heard, and this misinterpretation can cause fear or anxiety. For example, they might hear a war movie playing in the background or an air raid siren sound from, from a movie or television show, and they might actually think that there's a war going on around them or that they're part of that war. Some of the new fire alarms that you hear, um, and that includes fire alarms in public spaces or fire alarms in long-term care or in retirement settings, they don't sound like the regular smoke detectors or smoke alarms that we're used to. Uh, and that might cause some issues if the person hears these alarms going off and doesn't recognize the reason for them, doesn't re put two and two together that, oh, I'm hearing this sound and that means that there's a fire and I need to, I need to get out. Um, we actually heard a story about uh, a man who was formerly um, a firefighter. And so when he heard a smoke alarm go off at the long-term care home where he was living, he immediately ran around the home trying to rescue everyone because he still believed that that was his job. And that, that was just one of the side effects of um, that loss of ability to recognize and memory loss as well. I'm gonna hand things over to Shelby now and she's gonna talk about the next five common behavior changes that can occur in dementia. Great, thank you, Chris. Perfect, thank you. So the loss of language abilities is another common behavioral change in dementia. As we know, language is made up of both speech and comprehension. So in other words, it is both the words that we say and how we say them, and it is also our ability to understand what others are saying or communicating to us. When a person with dementia loses language abilities, a condition that is often referred to, and you may have heard of it, referred to as aphasia, they may have trouble with speaking or saying what they want to say. They might also have difficulty thinking of or using the right word, putting words in the right order, and saying words correctly. A person with dementia may say, I want a slice of coffee, instead of, I want a slice of cake. Or they may say, I want my cold sweater, when really what they're trying to say here is, I'm cold and I want my sweater. Their speech may also be vague because they are struggling to find the, what, the right words to describe what it is that they need. So for example, you know, the statement, I need to go where they feed you, that might, leave us wondering, you know, are they, are they referring to the kitchen? Are they referring to the dining room? Uh, perhaps a restaurant or even the refrigerator um, to, because they're trying to say something about getting food. So again, a message might come across as being more vague and we might be trying to figure out what exactly are, are they looking for. In terms of comprehension, the person with dementia may have trouble understanding what others are saying to them. They may also have trouble understanding what is heard 
and also what the meaning um, of, of certain words are. Language loss really depends on the area of the brain that is affected and can really be unique from person to person. The person may also begin to, to withdraw from conversations that they find are, are too hard to follow. So sometimes we hear people with dementia share that, you know, even early in, in the diagnosis, that social settings can become difficult and sometimes they find themselves withdrawing from a conversation if it's, if it's too difficult to follow along. In other cases, they may also resort to using their first language. So for example, someone who didn't um, speak English until they immigrated to Canada. So say they came to Canada in their, in their 20s and that's when they, they learned to speak English. Um, due to the damage from the, the, to the brain with dementia, they may actually um, resume speaking their first language because of that unraveling memory. So maybe that person in their 20s previously spoke Polish and maybe that's the language that they're, they're now beginning to speak. In addition, the person with dementia may have uh, difficulty understanding written words or symbols. So we might notice some changes with reading. We might notice that the person's having more difficulty with reading and that's becoming more problematic for them. Another behavior change that can occur with dementia um, is a loss of purposeful or intentional movement. The person may experience difficulty directing their body parts to do familiar tasks or to even get those body parts moving in the first place. So it's not that there's something physically wrong with you know, their muscles and the way their muscles move. It's that, that connection with the brain to get that, that body part moving that that becomes difficult here. The person with dementia may lose the ability to plan and sequence their activities, or in other words, they might experience challenging, challenges putting things in order or following the steps of a task or activity. So more complicated tasks like banking, cooking, dressing, you know, these tasks that actually do have a lot of steps when we kind of think about it and break it down, there are a lot of steps involved. Um, these can become uh, more difficult and present some of the greatest challenges for the person with dementia. The person living with dementia experiencing a loss of purposeful movement may also have trouble following instructions or directions when they are given to them. So it may actually appear as though the person is not listening to the direction or the the request, but really their brain is having a hard time, again, communicating to that body part about what it needs to do. So that might be where, where the holdup is. As dementia progresses, the person's sense of space may eventually be affected and they may have increased difficulty in understanding specific directions like knowing their left from their right, for example, or their front from their back. So it may not be helpful to use directions like, okay, let's put your right arm in your right sleeve because those directions may no longer be understood by the person living with dementia. So we might have to more so show them and demonstrate what we mean if, if um, having them understand those directions is becoming difficult. So loss of motivation. So apathy is, is another term for this. And it's a common term used to describe a loss of motivation that a person living with dementia may experience as their brain continues to change. When there is damage or atrophy in the, the frontal lobe of the brain, we sometimes see the initiation centers in that part of the brain become impacted. When the initiation centers are affected, a person with dementia may lose the ability to start activities, even if they are interested in that particular activity. So sometimes we say, you know, if you imagine if there's like an initiation switch in your brain, with this lot of loss of motivation, with this apathy, 
it can become stuck in the off position. So the person may see an activity or something that they would normally engage in, and it just doesn't occur to them to engage in that activity anymore. So an example of this, um, perhaps the person living with dementia loved going for walks. Perhaps they loved walking the dog. And maybe they're seeing, you know, that, that nice sunny day, that nice weather, even the dog kind of whining at their feet, you know, I want to go outside, I want to go outside type of uh, vibe. Um, the person with dementia may see all of those signals that got them up and going before, and it doesn't occur to them to go outside for that walk or to take the dog for a walk, for example. So that initiation switch, it's, it's stuck in that off position. So they may lose the motivation to get involved or stay involved in activities or social opportunities. Um, to pursue involvement in tasks that they've always enjoyed. So we might see a change there. A person with apathy may show little or no emotional response to a particular situation or experience as well. Sometimes it may appear to the care partners and the family members as though the, the person simply um, does not care about a situation that is happening or about how their response or behavior may impact others. Some care partners have, have described the person with dementia as taking on somewhat of a vacant look when there's little or no facial expression to demonstrate how they may be reacting or how they may be feeling in response to a certain situation. So again, there may not be that, not only that engagement, but that emotional response as well, that feedback might be hard to, to get. So, you know, we might see the person living with dementia, they might be sitting on the couch, the TV's on, they might have the remote right by them, they might have a magazine in their lap, you know, all of these different things around them and they may not be engaging with, with those different things. And, and we might be having a hard time trying to figure out kind of how they're feeling. Loss of motivation can become more apparent in persons with dementia that have formerly experienced a significant amount of agitation or restless behavior. And a, a care partner or, or family member may actually mistake this as the person improving because this apathy and this loss of motivation may cause the person with dementia to experience less agitation and less restless behavior. And while apathetic behavior may closely resemble depression, it's very important to recognize that apathy is not depression. Both depression and apathy can be present in a person living with dementia, but it is key to recognize the difference between the two. So depression can result from chemical changes in the brain that result in the person not having the same drive, or initiative to involve themselves in an activity or a social opportunity. A person with depression can usually explain their reluctance to stay involved in doing something by saying, you know, I'm just not feeling up for it today, or I don't have the energy to do that right now, or I, I just don't feel like going out and being surrounded by people. So in other words, there's there's a reason for why the person is demonstrating that lack of initiative. And it's usually the result of an emotion, like feeling sad, energyless, overwhelmed, or not feeling up to it. So essentially, there's an emotional quality attached to the reason that the person does not want to stay engaged or do something. With apathy or loss of motivation, there's, there's no emotional reason for the person not having the motivation. It simply does not occur to the person to do anything at all as a result of the brain changes that are happening and the damage to those initiation centers that we talked about. Okay, so misinterpretation is another common behavior change. And misinterpretation refers to when a person with dementia has trouble perceiving the world around them correctly. Again, this particular loss of perception is caused due to the increased damage in the brain as a result of dementia. 
a person with dementia experiencing um, misinterpretation or altered perception may experience illusions, or more specifically, they misperceive what they are seeing, hearing, or experiencing. So there's something there. There's, there's maybe an object there. There is a sound happening, but they're misperceiving what, what that is or what that means. So some examples of this might involve the person seeing one object as something quite different. So for example, a pillow on a bed might look like someone sitting there or a lamp or a coat rack in the corner of the room might look like someone is, is perhaps standing there or lurking there. They may hear the telephone ring and instead go to the front door expecting to see someone there that has rung the doorbell. So some examples there of, of illusions. Uh, persons with dementia may also experience hallucinations, which involves seeing or hearing something that is not there. So this is also a result of the, the changes or damage in the brain. So the person may see bugs crawling over the walls or perhaps a snake in the corner of, of their room, which could create significant fear and anxiety for the person. It does not help to simply dismiss their hallucination and say you know, that there's nothing or that they're just seeing things because their brain is really telling them that they are seeing something there. Some hallucinations may not cause any fear or anxiety because the person may see things that bring um, feelings of, of happiness or intrigue or something that simply does not bother them. So this often um, revolves around uh, animals and children. So they might see bunnies playing in the room, for example, or children playing in the yard. And so sometimes that's something that we may not need to address if it's something that's not bothering the person. Loss of um, color perception, depth perception, and peripheral vision are other areas of loss that a person living with dementia may experience as the damage in the brain increases over time. People with dementia experiencing altered perception can lose um, their sense of depth perception and this is a result of the damage to the occipital lobe at the back of the brain. The person may lose the ability to see in, in three dimensions. So really everything may start to appear flat and they may have a difficult time navigating their environment um, when they're no longer able to see over, under or around things. So their world starts to take on a two dimensional look. So you can imagine how tricky that would be if everything in our atmosphere starts to look flat and, and kind of blend together. It could be really hard to navigate our environment. So it might be hard for the person to essentially tell where one thing starts and one thing ends. And essentially things can appear to blend together and lose definition. So this may happen when the person's watching TV, um, when they're navigating the stairs, they may have a hard time um, being able to tell how, how much the drop is from step to step. And even, even getting in and out of the bathtub or the shower may become more difficult because the bathtub may appear to be bottomless to the person. So, you know, sometimes that can be something that's, that's actually one of the barriers or obstacles to assisting the person with bathing because they're misinterpreting what they're seeing with the bathtub. Loss of color perception is also common in dementia when that occipital lobe is affected. The hues and colors may not appear to be as bright. And again, items can then start to lose their, their definition. A person with dementia may have difficulty seeing, for example, a poached egg on a white plate because everything is white. Let's say that person loves mashed, mashed potatoes and all of a sudden we're noticing they're not eating them, but they're eating their broccoli, which they definitely did not like as much. But if that those white mashed potatoes are on a white plate, they may not actually be able to see those mashed potatoes on the plate very well. If we change the color of the plate, we might see a different outcome. And again, this can also be an example where we 
we use the bathtub because the bathtub is white. So sometimes again, it might appear bottomless if they're having a hard time kind of figuring out and, and seeing where the edge of the bathtub is and how deep it is. And again, another area where we might see this is an environment with, um, sometimes we see this with, with some hospital environments where everything is white. If the floors are white, the walls are white, um, a person with dementia can have a difficult time navigating that because they're having a hard time figuring out, you know, where the turns are, where the doors are, because that definition is taken away by everything being white. And finally, a person living with dementia can also um, lose their peripheral vision, which results in that, that tunnel vision. So if we hold our hands up here, we can kind of get a feel for what that loss of peripheral vision and that tunnel vision might be like. So they may not be able to uh, see objects or people outside of that, that front central vision. So it's easy for the person to become startled um, when someone comes up from behind them or sometimes even from, from the side, because if they are experiencing those changes with peripheral vision, um, they may not see that person approaching. So, so that could be quite startling for them. The loss of ability to keep uh, attention or shift attention is another common behavior in dementia. So attentional deficits occur because of increasing damage to the brain as dementia progresses. The person with dementia who experiences this behavior may have trouble keeping focus on one thing at a time, or they may have trouble changing their focus from one thing to another. Individuals with dementia can uh, become easily distracted and have trouble staying on task or completing the steps of a task. So a, a common example of this might be, you know, a person with dementia gets up from the table before finishing their meal, even though they had commented on how hungry they were and, um, and they haven't eaten much food on their plate. So perhaps they had, had trouble kind of keeping that, that focus on the meal and um, they popped up from the table. They may also demonstrate uh, repetitive actions as well. So this might include folding and unfolding a napkin over and over again, perhaps polishing the counter um, over and over again, or, or tapping something constantly. And this happens because they are getting stuck on a particular repetitive action and they can't switch to something else. So they may continue to repeat that action until um, something significant or meaningful or, or someone, a person, um, directs their attention to something else. So an example of this uh, with, with a family that I worked with, they were noticing that uh, in, in the, the summertime that their mom was always outside weeding in, in their lawn or in her lawn. And she would just continue to go out and pull weeds. And they realized that she actually wasn't able to, to stop that when she got started. So they had to think of some strategies for how they could um, redirect her. So sometimes they were um, able to have a neighbor help, you know, when, if the neighbor had noticed that she had been out there for a while, or sometimes they would have to stop by as well because her brain got stuck on that task and wasn't able to, to shift to something else. Okay, so those are the eight common behavior changes that we can see with dementia. You may have heard of them referred to in the past as the eight A's of dementia as well. Um, so those are some of the most common changes that, that we might see. So I'm going to hand it back over to Chris now to talk about um, how we might look at behavior in general. Thanks so much, Shelby. Yeah, so now that uh, we've had a chance to understand why those responsive behaviors might occur, here's just some key points to keep in mind when we are thinking about those behavioral changes. So the first point is that, you know, behavior is a mean or is a means of communicating. So the behaviors that we're seeing um, are a person's way of, of expressing themselves, you know, maybe when words aren't, aren't working for them. 
there's always meaning behind the behavior. So the person isn't doing it on purpose. There is a reason for the behavior. Third, third here is that most behavioral displays don't last too long. So they're what we refer to as time limited or episodic. Behaviors happen because the person's trying to communicate something to us, you know, whether it's a need that's not being met, uh, a dislike for something, an urgency that they have to solve a problem, or really any number of things. And the behavior occurs as a way of expressing themselves whenever they might have a hard time getting their point across, but it doesn't usually go on and on. Uh, due to the progressive memory loss, they most likely will have forgotten about, you know, what it was that was triggering that behavior after some time. Most behavioral displays are the result of an unmet need. So it could be the care partners and the family members are having a hard time uh, understanding how to meet the person's need, or perhaps it's not possible in that moment to meet the person's need. It might be that the person with dementia has lost the ability to effectively communicate what that pressing need is. So the behavior occurs as a result. And that, you know, as I mentioned, that really happens when, you know, verbal, con verbal communication isn't successful for them. And lastly, on the screen there, you see difficult behavior is responsive behavior. So we can't deny that behavior might be difficult to address or to know how to respond to, but the person isn't doing it on purpose to be difficult. The behavior is occurring as a response to something. These are, are some of the examples of the most common types or forms of responsive behavior. So these are the things that we might see or the things that we're talking about when we say responsive behaviors. So we've got a bit of a list here. So things like agitation, aggression, um, a catastrophic reaction, which is otherwise known as like an emotional outburst, uh, late day restlessness, um, which you may also hear as uh, referred to as sundowning. So that's, you know, that, that restlessness or agitation or anxiety that can occur at the end of the day. Repetition, uh, this can be verbal repetition. This can be, um, you know, maybe wringing hands or wiping or um, clicking your fingernails. Like it could be a, a behavioral repetition as well. Withdrawal, wandering or pacing, uh, suspicion and paranoia, rummaging or collecting behavior. Um, and then we see inappropriate behavior here. And we put the, this kind of in quotations because we say inappropriate for lack of a better word, um, but we're really referring to a behavior that might be outside of the person's usual character or that might not seem appropriate given the situation. And lastly, we have sexual expression on the list. We wanted to share the most common types of responsive behaviors with you because many of them occur for the reasons that we just talked about. So it's important to remember that if you see any of these behaviors occurring, that they are common when a person has dementia. So they might seem strange or different from the behavior that the person has demonstrated in the past, but you know we're here to kind of assure you that it is normal to see these behaviors happening especially when there's so many changes taking place in the brain. So now that, you know, we've had that chance to increase our understanding of why behavior change happens when a person has dementia, here's some effective strategies for addressing those responsive behaviors when we do see them. So the first tip here is to look for what might be triggering the behavior. So if, if it's possible, you know, if we can remove that trigger or if we can take the person out of the environment where the trigger is um, to where it's no longer present, that could help resolve that behavior. That could help resolve or meet that need of what's going on. Next is to keep the person physically active with light exercise to avoid pent up energy. So light exercise can help 
the person stays stimulated and it provides an outlet for releasing any negative energy that might influence the person's behavior. Um, so that that's just one way, even if it's, you know, just doing something like a walk or just doing light exercises, you know, indoors, chair exercises, that can be helpful. We want to use positive verbal communication and body language. So lean in to listen, show that you're being an active listener, smile, respond, and nod to the person to let them know that you're there and you're attentive to what they're trying to communicate. Positive body language sends the message that you're understanding and that you're receptive to, to what it is they're trying to say. Also, redirection. So redirecting with food, with a cup of tea, um, maybe with pictures or quiet conversation. We don't exactly know what it is about that promise of food or a cup of tea or a bowl of ice cream, but what it is about that, but it is a successful way to often redirect the person from something that's unpleasant or something that's bothering them. It must be that comfort that, that food often offers. It might also help to redirect the person to engaging in an activity that they enjoy or find comfort in. So, you know, that could be something like looking at old pictures together or having a quiet conversation where they can talk about something that they enjoy or reminiscing about things from their past. Uh, even listening to music or, you know, uh, getting in the kitchen and, and doing some baking, that kind of thing can be uh, a good way to redirect. Give the person as much space and control as possible. So the person, they might be demonstrating this behavior because they feel that they've lost control over the situation. And it can help to give them as much space as possible so that they can, you know, really work on de-escalating themselves and to restore that level of calm. Sometimes, um, just having us there, the presence of that care partner uh, and that person trying to step in and help, and help, you know, we all often want to be helpful, but at times that can make the situation escalate further. So if we can, you know, it's best to remove ourselves from the situation. You know, we don't want to leave the person alone um, and we don't want to abandon them, but, you know, just making an excuse to to briefly leave, like, oh, I'm just going into the other room to grab our, our cup of tea that's been steeping. And then watching from afar, um, sometimes where they can't see you, can't see you or having somebody different come in and check in on them to see how they're doing. Sometimes as much as we don't like to think it, but sometimes we can be the trigger in a situation, you know, if 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 we're the if we've said something or for the reason that the person is is feeling upset, sometimes just offering that space is is our best approach. Asking the person what's wrong because sometimes they are able to tell you. We sometimes forget that we can check in with the person and we can ask what's wrong and we can ask how they'd like us to help. Um, we sometimes assume that the person might not be able to communicate how they're feeling or what they're thinking, but we should always make that effort to see if they can tell us what's wrong. Next, we wanna determine what activities provide them with enjoyment and incorporate those activities into our intervention plan. So knowing what activities bring the person a sense of calm or a sense of enjoyment and ensuring that these are part of a, kind of the plan, like these, this is what we're gonna do if they start to demonstrate a responsive behavior, we're gonna have that thing that they enjoy tucked in our back pocket to pull out um, in the event that those behaviors occur. So if the person starts to become agitated in the late afternoon hours, um, it might be helpful to keep that person engaged in activities like you know, maybe asking them to help set the table for dinner, ask them to help peel some potatoes, ask them to fold napkins, because if they're focused on something else, that might take their mind off of um, the things that are causing them anxiety at that time. Also, ensuring a calm and a safe environment. So it's helpful if we can 
provide a calm space or a safe space where the person can retreat if they're feeling anxious or if they're feeling overwhelmed. A familiar safe environment that's away from any noise or any distractions can be really important to help us de-escalate those behaviors. So if you think of, you know, hosting a family gathering and we've got, you know, lots of people in the house over for dinner and the conversation's getting loud and it's busy, that could become overwhelming for the person. So it's really nice if we can have a room set up, you know, that allows them as a little spot to retreat away from that busy, noisy environment for a period of time. And next, we want to share our ideas and our successes with others. So if we found a great strategy that works with the person to address the behaviors that we're seeing. It's really important that we can share that with the other, other people that are in that person's you know, circle of support. So if we can find consistent approaches that can be used by anyone who is supporting that person, uh, then we might be able to create that consistent success uh, or helpful results if we're, if we're using that same approach every time. Okay, so as we near the end of our presentation here, uh, I'm going to pass things back over to Shelby just to summarize. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so all behavior has meaning is, is really a phrase that comes up quite often when we talk about behavior with dementia and, and kind of becomes a bit of a mantra. So here are some important points to consider and remember when supporting a person uh, with dementia. So changes in behavior are often seen as a result of a disease process. So we want to remember that the person um, with dementia is not trying to push your buttons or to upset you, um, or you know they, they aren't doing many of these changes in behavior on purpose. The changes you are seeing in the behavior are a result of the changes that are happening in the brain as a result of, of dementia. When you see something you know, strange or different or unnerving happening, always take it back to the brain, understanding that, that there are changes happening with the brain and that the person cannot help it. Also try not to take any behavior personally. So we know that sometimes this can be easier said than done, but we want to remember that the person with dementia would not mean to hurt you, you know, for the world. Um, it is very easy to take the behavior personally, but we want to remember that the person may be acting out of uh, frustration, an unmet need, or because they are confused about what is happening around them. And perhaps they're having significant communication changes as well, and they're having a hard time being able to communicate that. Their first thought is to protect and defend themselves from something that appears to them as though it is a threat to their personhood. So we want to remember that responsive behavior is, is essentially human behavior. It is something that we are all capable of demonstrating given a certain set of circumstances or a specific reality. We act on what our brain is, is telling us at any given moment, essentially. So it's no different for the person living with dementia, except their brain is not always providing them with the correct information and their reality may be different than ours. We also want to look for the person behind the disease because they are still there. So it's important to, to know that person, to keep the person at the center of everything that we do with them and to treat them with respect and understanding. We want to um, avoid defining them by the disease um, or, or their dementia. Uh, that they have and instead see them as a person living with a disease. We also want to build on strengths and abilities as best as possible. So it, it can be easy to get caught up in the losses that a person with dementia may experience as their brain continues to experience change. And there's no denying that um, we are seeing a significant amount of change and loss of many of the person's skills and abilities. With that understanding though, we still need to identify the person's um, strengths and abilities uh, that remain and to build on what they can still do. So, you know, perhaps they can no longer button up their shirt, but they can still put their shirt on. You know, that's an important achievement. Perhaps they can't make the family 
uh, recipe that they always made from, from scratch or from, from memory, but perhaps they can still do pieces of that preparation. So we want to recognize those remaining strengths. And also focus on the positive. So it can be difficult to see the positive sometimes when so much change is happening, um, but focusing on the positive can help us to stay motivated, to continue on this caregiving journey and to find the positives in each and every day. When we focus on the positive, it does help us to reduce stress and to find ways to help the person to live as well as possible with dementia. So we always want to keep in mind that each person is unique. So we often say, when you've met one person with dementia, you have met one person with dementia. You know, we talked about a lot of different behavior changes today, but that doesn't mean that every single person on the call here is noticing um, each of those behavior changes with the person they're supporting. Each person's probably noticing some, some different changes with the person they're supporting. We all communicate by emotion, expression, and touch. Um, so it's important to recognize here that communication is still achievable. Effective communication can, can also help us to reduce responsive behaviors. And, and in line with this of, you know, the whole idea of communication by emotion, uh, we want to recognize that feelings remain despite the losses. So the person with dementia may forget a lot of things um, because of the memory loss that they're experiencing, um, but they may not forget the way um, that, that you made them feel. So, you know, that, that, that communication by emotion is still very much there. And we also want to be sure to include the person with dementia. So it may be upsetting for the person with dementia to not always understand what others are saying to them, but it can be quite painful not to be included, you know, in that, in that conversation in the first place. When the assumption is made that the person won't be able to participate in the dialogue or understand what's being said. So again, we always want to try to include the person with dementia. And when we are faced with behaviors that we are unsure of how to deal with, it it's helps to remember that again, all behavior has meaning. So there's a meaning behind the message that, that the person's trying to send us. All behavior has a reason. So here we want to kind of step back and think, what is the person trying to tell, tell me? You know, what, 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 are, what message are they trying to get across? And also recognize that your response influences the behavior. So your response may have a good impact and it may result in the behavior uh, de-escalating or perhaps being avoided in the future. But if we are not careful, um, we may actually succeed in making the behavior worse. So we always want to try to put ourselves in the person's perspective and try to determine that, that meaning behind the behavior. When we know why it's happening, we can put some helpful strategies in place so that hopefully the behavior can be respectfully addressed or avoided in the future. So uh, 11.30 right on the dot, um, as we wrap up today, we. We recognize that some of you may be joining us for the first time and perhaps aren't connected um, with the Alzheimer's Society, um, but here you have the contact information for Maddie, um, who is our intake coordinator. And Maddie is that, that first um, person that you kind of speak to when you want are interested or want to access services from the Alzheimer's Society. So um, she'll be able to uh, listen to your story and match you with the best programs and, um, and people that can support you. So um, please feel free to reach out to Maddie. And again, we are also here if you have any questions about our presentation today. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording so um, we can have some time for questions.